Our scripture for this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. I'll see him better with this one. <laughs> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was in the world, that God was reconciled in the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would bless our hearts with the truth of your word. Lord, impress your word on our heart. Lord, give me the words. Send your spirit to reveal your truth to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to talk about thriving in 2017. <clears throat> and it's kind of interesting that we have 517 for 2017. And so remember that. And you know what? If you, I don't think I have a, oh, yeah, I do have a bulletin. Even on the front of the bulletin for the new year, I don't know if Bonnie worked extra hard to find this or, or if God just did it, but we have 2 Corinthians 5.17 on the bulletin. So, hey, everything's in sync for the new year so far. Um, and it talks about something new. And what's even better than a new year is a new creation. A new creation, and that's what Jesus came for. The old has gone, the new has come. You know, at midnight, we kind of take that glimpse back on 2016, and we say, thank God I survived. <laughs> and depending on what happened in, in 2016 for you, maybe you're, you're really glad to move on and have a fresh start. And even if things went well, we're often still kind of enthusiastic about a, a fresh start. And so I want to look at finding purpose in 2017. You know, what resolutions will we make that will make 2017 meaningful? What will give us a sense of purpose? And what is thriving all about? You know, there's a lot of people just existing. And I don't know about you, but I am just not satisfied to just exist and survive. I believe God wants more for us. He wants us to thrive. Now, that might look different in different ones of our lives, and uh, obviously it will. But I want to look at the, the three M's of thriving in 2017. And what we'll do is we'll take one, one step back and two steps forward. And you know, as long as we're doing that, we're still moving forward. It's when we take the two steps back and one step forward that it doesn't feel so good. But this morning, we're going to just take one step back and two steps forward. Looking back, number one is the memory of reconciliation. Reconciliation. Have you ever been reconciled with somebody, another person? Maybe it's a friend that you just kind of drifted away, or maybe you had it out with them. Maybe it's a family member that somebody said, I'm never going to talk to you again. I never want to see you again, or something similar. Maybe there was an issue that you just never got over. And then at some point, you were reconciled with them. Isn't that a sweet feeling? Isn't that a wonderful feeling? To have that reconciliation. And so that's really what reconciliation is. It's getting relationships back together. 
But there's a bigger relationship, and that's our relationship with God. To be reconciled to him. Because you know what? Because of the sin in our lives, even as infants were born into sin, there's a gap between us and God. And so I want to look at the memory of reconciliation. You know, there's a point of spiritual transaction where we become a new creation. The scripture makes that really clear. There's a point where we become a new creation. The sinful nature that we were born with. And you know, we, we might do good things in a general sense. And we might believe in God in a, in a vague sense. But that's not the same as what he talks about here. He said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed, the new has come. Do you remember that time in your life? You know, I was about 16 years old. And, you know, I, I showed my sinful bent in several ways before that. I mean, I, I had some things going on that weren't... Uh, honoring God. But you know, I remember, and, and I always believed in God, believed that he was there, prayed to him when I was in trouble. You know, oh God, get me out of this, I'll never do it again. You know, those kind of prayers. But I will never forget the day when I acknowledged that I needed Jesus and I needed his forgiveness. And I was kind of a tough guy at that point, and I cried like a baby. It felt so good to be loved, so good to be clean. I remember to this day just feeling so clean and so forgiven. And it was the greatest thing. And you know, that memory still compels me today to just how beautiful it is when we meet Jesus. <clears throat> When we're independent of God, there's just a natural bent towards sinfulness and selfishness. When we accept Jesus, that makes us new. Once in a while I hear people say, well, I've always been a Christian. Well, it makes me wonder, where's that time when the old past and the new has come? Now, I know people who, they, they made a decision for Jesus at two or three years old. They may not remember all of those things, but, you know, they have recommitted those things. Because I believe if you, you accept Jesus when you're like three, you're probably going to have to make some choices later to keep on going, you know. Um, so it doesn't matter what age. I mean, I remember a couple of my kids at, you know, two or three, they would, I want to receive Jesus. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Had one say, Lord Jesus, come into my belly. He kind of got it a little bit, you know, a few inches lower. He had the right idea, but. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but there is always a cross in our history, if you think about it. You have life before, and then you have this cross. Where Jesus became real where we become new. And then after that, we have the process of continuing to become new in, in more ways. So the memory of reconciliation. Do you remember feeling fully forgiven and loved by God for the first time? And even after we make that decision, we still choose how much we live in the old and how much we live in the new, don't we? You know, every day I can step back and kind of live in the old the way that the world does, not really commit a lot of sin or do anything terrible, but live essentially apart from God. Or I can go over here and say, you know what, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to let him live through me. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to be by grace. And most of the good things that I do are going to be by his, his grace but it's still an ongoing choice. We choose how much of the old we live out and how much of the new. And think about that even in this coming year. 
How much are you going to live in 2016 and how much are you going to live in 2017? You can't really go back, can you? I mean, I guess you, you could. You could think about it. You could be stuck there. But it's not going to get you anywhere. And it's the same about going back into the old nature, the before Christ part of us. It's not going to get you anywhere. You know, before we could only live in the sinful nature because that's all we had. After Jesus, we live in the spiritual nature, the Christ-like nature. Ask yourself, how much am I living in the old and how much am I living in, in the new? And you know, we're never going to thrive if we're living over here. You can read all kinds of motivational books and ideas and things that you can do to thrive and enjoy life. But you know what? It's all going to fall, fall apart at some point without Jesus. But you know, when you're following Jesus, when you're doing what he wants you to do, you may not see the benefits, you may not see all of the outward things, but you know what? You know that there's a purpose in your life and you know that there's a reason to get up in the morning and even if there's lots of trials that you're going through, Jesus is there and it's meaningful and it's real. And he's going to help you overcome. Looking forward, it's the ministry of reconciliation. And that's directly from Scripture here. If I get the right page. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. So he did the work of making us right with him through Christ. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, who's Paul talking to there? Is he talking to just himself and a couple of his, you know, apostle friends? No, he's talking to the church. He's talking to each one of us. And some of, some of you say, wait, wait, wait a minute, a ministry of reconciliation. I, I'm not a pastor. I'm not an elder. I'm not a super spiritual person. So I, that's not so much what he's talking about here. God is in the world reconciling people to himself, and he has chosen to use us. He wants us to participate. You know, theoretically, it's not that he would need us, that he couldn't do it without us, but he's chosen to do it in us and through us. He wants us to participate. So the best way to thrive in 20, 2017 is to focus our lives on what God has already committed himself to. Instead of saying, God help me or God bless the plans that I make, we say, God, help me plan the things that you bless. Let me get on board of what you're already doing. And I'll tell you something that, that I think will help. It doesn't have to be just religious stuff. I believe much of our ministry of reconciliation is in daily life. They used to call it friendship evangelism, where you, you know, you become friends with people. You, you do, you live among people. And you look for ways to bring people just one step closer. And boy, that takes off some of the pressure, doesn't it? Lots of times when we think of ministry, um, I don't know if you've ever done this. There was a time back in the 80s that I was part of a team that we would go out and <laughs> knock on doors, tell people about Jesus, and basically you would either convert them or get them so ticked off that they never wanted to talk to a Christian again. <laughs> that seemed like the way, and for most of us, that's not comfortable, is it? You say, I don't want to be on the evangelism team. That's... You know, that's scary. And I don't believe that's what, not that that can't work in certain ways. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't want to throw cold water on that. But, you know, for most of us, that's not how we're going to reach people. That's not how we're going to help people get one step closer to Jesus. And, you know, that's the other thing. It's only one step. We don't have to 
We don't have to take them the whole way. We have to try to love them enough to help them break down those barriers. What is it that they think about Jesus and they think about church that's messing them up? How can we be different from that? How can we show them that there is somebody who's real, somebody who's genuine, somebody who lives it, instead of just people who talk about it? And I think that's where we participate. He says, we implore you, be reconciled to God. Literally, it's we beg you to be reconciled to God. Have you ever done that? Have you ever sat down with somebody that you really care about? I've done it a couple times with some of my kids with lots of prayer and hope, hopefully the right timing to say, hey, I want to see you in heaven. I want to see you follow Jesus. I want to see God be the center of your life again because I want good things for you. And I think in the right time and with the right heart, when you say that, it, it gets in. They may not respond immediately. But you know, I believe, especially people that we love and that we've earned that right to talk to like that, they're not going to get over that. You know, they're not going to get over that. They're going to remember. It's like, yeah, yeah. And maybe somebody else is going to come later and share that kind of love or Invite them to church or do something that helps them take that one step. You know, because there's a lot of people, they've been beat up. There's a lot of people been beat up by churches. Let's be honest. I often used to talk about the unchurched and the mischurched. There's a lot of mischurched people out there. Church is the last place that they ever want to go. And you know, I think if they could see Jesus... And realize that, wait a minute, whatever happened to me, that's not really what Jesus is like. And there's where you and I can be those genuine, caring people. Like I know that you are. You know, you've got what it takes. You know, you don't have to memorize the whole Bible or be able to answer every question that anybody could ever bring up. You just have to be genuine in your walk with God. And they'll see it. He says, we beg you to be reconciled with God because Paul knows the consequences of not being reconciled with God. That's very real. And you know, we, we don't hear a lot of people preach about hell because it scares people, right? We don't, and we don't really want to, I'm not all about scaring them into the kingdom either. But it's still a real place and it's a reality that if we love people, we beg them. To be right with God in the right way, in the right time. It says, We are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. God's going to reach the people that we know through you and me. That's the way he's designed it. We're his ambassadors, we're his voice. God's reaching the lost through you and me. Then number three, I want to look at the message of reconciliation. So what's, what's the message? You know, there's the, the lifestyle, which is the whole ministry, but then there's the message. I believe it was St. Fran Francis that used to say, preach the gospel at all times and use words when necessary. <laughs> so preach it through our lives. But sometimes we need the words and the message here is one of the clearest in Scripture. He says, we implore you on Christ's behalf to do a couple things. A, to be reconciled to God. Pretty easy to understand, right? To be reconciled to God. To tell somebody, I want you and God to get along. <laughs> Boy, I wish you knew him. I wish you knew what he's really like. I think you'd like him. I think you'd love him. Easy, right? Easy to understand? B, 
Find forgiveness for your sin. I don't know too many people who don't want forgiveness. Feels good to be forgiven, doesn't it? Whether it's by a person or by Jesus. Feels good to be forgiven. And then the third thing, see here, is become righteous through Jesus working in you. It's pretty much just a three-step thing. Be reconciled to God. Find forgiveness for your sin. And find righteousness in Jesus. That's the gospel message. You don't have to be a Bible scholar or a genius to be able to share that. Any child can memorize that, can remember those things. That's the message of reconciliation. You know, Jesus already did his part in dying for our sins, and he's continuing to do his part now. We just sometimes have to let people know about it. So a lot of people don't know about Jesus. We have that opportunity to let them know. To let them know they can be right with God. A lot of people don't believe that. They believe that I'm too messed up. God, even God doesn't love me. We'd be surprised how many people believe that. Or they believe that, you know, after what I've done... There's no forgiveness for that. God, even God can't forgive me for what I've done. I've done. It's too terrible. I'm here to tell you this morning that there's nothing beyond the grace of God, beyond the forgiveness. Jesus died for all sin one time. And the idea of becoming righteous in Jesus sometimes is a stretch. That's a stretch for me, and I've been walking with Jesus for over 30 years. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? Any righteousness that we have, it's because of him. And it feels good to know that I am righteous in God's sight because of Jesus. A simple message, an appealing message. The summary of the whole Christian message here, if we look at Chapter 5, verse 21. And you know, this would be a good one to write someplace if you haven't done any scripture memory. Memorize this one. It's about as simple as it gets. It says, God made him who had no sin. Of course, that's Jesus. To be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what the gospel's about. That's what Jesus came for. I want to look at three practical considerations. Because we could understand this and then just not do a lot about it. But I want to make this real practical. Uh, first of all, make sure that you have chosen to allow Jesus to make you new. Make sure that you have that transaction where the old has gone and the new has come. And number two, I'm going to encourage you to choose a prayer target for 2017. Choose a prayer target for 2017. Who would you most like to see come to saving faith in Jesus Christ in 2017? Maybe that's somebody who is really, really close to you. Or maybe, you know, you want to you stretch your faith. And I've, I've had people say even, find the person who you least, would least think would come to Christ and start praying for them and watch God do a miracle. So I don't think it matters so much how, how you approach this. But one or two people that you would like to see come to Jesus in 2017. I think that'll make life meaningful. God's going to do the work. You just pray for them. Lord Jesus, show them today who you are. Lord Jesus, take them one step closer. And when you see them and you say hello, and they see you smile, 
They're one step closer. You know, a lot of times you don't have to do anything. It's just your presence. We live in a pretty uncaring society in many ways, so if you just show some care, some love, it'll make a difference. But what you're doing that whole time is you're trusting God to do his part, and you're asking God to do his part. And, you know, I have done this in, in the past, and I've prayed for people who it's like, there is no way. I mean, I could not picture it. And yet that person came to Christ because God does the work. We serve a miracle work in God, don't we? And every one of us, when we come to Jesus, it's a miracle. The old has passed. The new has come. And then number three, just look for opportunities to take people one step closer to Jesus, knowing he's already doing the work. Just look for opportunities. And, you know, a lot of times when it's people who are really close to us, it's listening more and talking less. Doing more and talking less. They may not want to hear it. <clears throat> we've probably already told them, we've already, already give them a, given them a little bit too much advice and kind of, you need to be a church, you know, we've kind of done that. They're, they are already guarded against that. So maybe it's listening a little bit more. Giving them some hope. Giving them some help. Finding ways to break down that barrier just a little bit at a time. And I'll tell you what, it's an exciting ride. It's enjoyable. It's fulfilling to see God work in the lives of people who we may never have expected him to work in. Be that ambassador who speaks and lives on behalf of Jesus. And I believe that's a resolution that's life-changing. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you this morning. We thank you for your grace that made it possible to be new, to start a new year, to be enthused, to have your spirit working within us. And God, we ask that you, by your grace, would use us for your glory and touch people's lives. Lord, that you would give us confidence, not in ourselves, but in you. And Lord, that you would then let us trust in you and watch you work. We pray for that in Jesus' name.